And if you have a Bible with you, perhaps you turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And I've entitled, I realise that, you know, the Easter story is pretty routine. Um, but I've entitled this sermon, Gang Fight in Gethsemane. Gang Fight in Gethsemane. We're going to read from chapter 26 of Matthew, from verse 47 right through to verse 56. Listen carefully. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come, with me, come for me with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. A dream without a positive attitude produces a daydreamer. A positive attitude without a dream produces a pleasant person who can't progress. A dream together with a positive attitude produces a person with unlimited possibilities and potential. I read a lovely story of a girl called Christina and her mum, Maria. They lived in just outside Rio de Janeiro. They were very poor. Uh, I think probably lived in one of the favelas and had a really hard time. And Christina just longed to do better. She saw the bright lights of the city. She wanted to be there. And she kept telling her mum, and her mum kept warning her that that's not the place a young girl should be. But one day she ran. When her mother found out, she got all the money she had together and she began her search. But on her way to the bus, she stopped off at the chemist. And she went into the little photo booth and she's had loads of photos taken of herself and she took them with her. She went to bars, hotels, nightclubs, any place with the reputation for street walkers and prostitutes. And at each place, she left her picture taped maybe to a bathroom mirror tacked to a hotel bulletin board or fastened to a corner of a phone booth and she just put a little note on the back of it. Well, she soon ran out of money and uh, she went home very sad and she missed her child. But a few weeks later, Christina was coming down the stairs of a very seedy hotel. The light really had gone through her eyes because, you know, she realised that it wasn't as good as she thought it was going to be. As she came down the stairs, she walked across the lobby and she saw a picture of someone she knew on the mirror. And it was her mum's picture. She went straight across and she grabbed it and she looked at the back and it said this. Whatever you've done, whatever you've become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And she did. Now here in a nutshell is the essence of the gospel that we preach. Every single one of us are the lost children who live to please ourselves. Drawn by the thought that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. The trouble with that thinking is once we get there we realise that it's not much different. It's just the same old issues and the same old problems just dressed up in a different way. And God has gone to the extreme lengths as a loving parent to, to put out his, his hand and say to each one of us, come home. But the plan that he's put in place to achieve our salvation actually involved a very tough journey for Jesus. It had to be endured. And it had to be done right so that we, the sons and daughters of men, might become the sons and daughters of God. 
Now we come at this point to the gospel at a very crucial, crucial stage of the ministry of Jesus. This is the bit that matters because the outcome depends on, on the outcome depends the destiny of the whole of humanity. And what is incredible here is despite having a knowledge of what is to come, Jesus remains positive and he demonstrates that he is the one we can model ourselves on as the one who's, who's got unlimited possibilities and unlimited potential. Now, of course, the background to this, this part of the story, is the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus has had to face the immediate future and demonstrates actually his full humanity with all the expressions of fear and turmoil because he knew what was coming. And he actually said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now, my sound strange to you, but do you not find that comforting? For those of us who have been faced with our mortality at one time or another, that's very comforting because, you know, if Jesus can be upset about dying, so can we. And then we arrive at verse 47. Jesus is ready. Soldier phrase, he got over himself. Okay? Now is the time to fulfill the plan the Father has set before him. And what we see here is this grace of composure about him. Fully God, fully man. And while he's still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrives. And with him he's got this great big crowd of blokes with clubs and swords and all sorts of things. And they've been sent by someone else, of course. Now this has been the night to top all nights, I'm sure, for Jesus. It's bad enough that he's got to go through the next days of torment. He knows what's coming. He knows about the beating. He knows about the crucifixion. He knows that he's going to be separated from his father on our behalf. He knows all of that. He knows he's got to fight, endure all of this. And it's bad enough that he's got to travel that road alone. It's bad enough that his friends don't get it and they go and fall asleep when he needs their support. But now he's betrayed by one of his inner circle and in his cowardice he brings along a crowd armed to the teeth. But do you know something? We really can't blame them. Because there's been several times throughout the story, if you read it, where they've tried to take Jesus. And I'm talking about they, that's the Jewish authorities and the temple guard. They tried to take him into custody and it's just not worked because it's not been the right time. In fact, in Luke chapter 4, we read of how they grabbed him and they took him to an edge of a cliff and they were going to throw him off, but he just walked right the way through the middle of them. If Jesus had wanted a fight, you know, he could have chosen the time, he could have chosen the place, he could have arranged the odds in his own favour, and instead he is composed. He's at, he's at peace and he's able to stand on, in the face of all the suffering of the coming hours. And, and that is the example of faith, isn't it? Now, I read this. Listen to this. To live by faith is to live joyfully. To live with assurance, untroubled by doubts and with complete confidence in all that we have to do and suffer at each moment by the will of God. We must realise that, in order, that is it, it is in order to stimulate and sustain this faith that God allows the soul to be buffeted and swept away by the raging torrent of so much distress, so many troubles, so much embarrassment and weakness and so many setbacks. For it is essential to have faith to find God behind all of this. Really profound words. Wouldn't it be great if we could live up to them? But I'll tell you what the reality is like. We're a bit like that man who was walking along the top of a cliff and slipped. And on his way down, heading towards the sea, he sees a branch and he grabs hold of it and he holds onto the branch. And he's hanging there, swinging. Help! Is anyone there? Help! And he feels his hand slipping. And as it's slipping, he hears a voice. He says, I'm here. I'm the Lord. Do you believe me? Yes, Lord, I believe you. I believe you. Please save me. He said, okay, don't panic. All you have to do, just let go of that branch. And there was a pause. And he said, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> But you see, that's us, isn't it? It's exactly how we are. Because you see, faith is easy when all is well. In the face of real challenge, it's a different story. That's the test when we go through the fire. When we have to experience God in a new way. It's when all of us is swept away and suddenly the things that we're used to controlling, we're not in control anymore. And suddenly God speaks into that quiet moment and he changes everything. 
Actually, everyone thinks you're mad after that. Now, here in our text, you see, is the culmination of Jesus' teaching on faith. Here is the accessibility for you and I who come with our fears and our quaking <laughs> knees to be in the presence of God and, and, and being able and being in a position to be able to discern his will and actually participate in the divine na nature. That is astounding. This is what this is all about, is so that we can be the children of God, so that we can know God personally. With all the composure that his grace provides. And that is the model of Jesus. That is the grace of composure. Then, of course, we have the grace that forgives. Now, imagine what I must, how it must feel. I'm sure some of you have been there when you know someone you've trusted betrays you, betrays your confidence. Look at verses 49. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. Do you know there's real integrity in this picture, you know? Because Jesus doesn't wait to be hunted down. He actually advances towards the betrayer. He goes to meet him. And I don't think the scene ever fails to shock. In the first instance, there's the hypocrisy of the kiss that's meant to be a gesture of affection and honour. And certainly for the Jewish readers, the symbolism here would resonate with the Old Testament. Now, quick scripture test, all right? So you're not getting off this morning, all those visitors here. Can anyone tell me where there's an example of a betrayal with a kiss in the Old Testament? Anyone? Come on, you know your Bibles. That's it, Ross. Give him a nudge in the ribs. He should know. Does anyone know? Okay, turn with me if you would, then we'll just have a quick look at it, at 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 20, and verses 4 to 10. I'm just going to read these few verses just to put you in the picture of what's happening here and see what happens. And the great thing about the Old Testament is it doesn't pull any punches and you've got all the gory bits as well. It's better than the pictures. Okay. To Samuel chapter 20, verse 4. Then the king, this is King David, said to Amasa, Summon the men of Judah to come, come to me within three days and be here yourself. But when Amasa went to summon Judah, he took longer than the time the king had set for him. So David said to Abishai, Now Sheba son of Bichri would do, do us more harm than Absalom did. Take your master's men and pursue him, or he will find fortified cities and escape from us. So Joab, who was one of the generals, Joab's men and the Kerithites and Pelathites and all the mighty warriors went out under, the, under command of Abishai. They marched out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. While they were, were at the great rock in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Now Joab was wearing his military tunic and strapped over it on his waist was a belt with a dagger in its sheath. As he stepped forward, it dropped out of its sheath. Joab said to Amasa, How are you, my brother? Then Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. Amasa was not on his guard against the dagger in Joab's hand, and Joab plunged it into his belly as his intestines spilled out on the ground. Without being stabbed again, Amasa died. Then Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba, son of Bichri. Now, the people reading this story originally would understand this. Here we have a picture of the Old Testament coming in the New Testament. And a powerful image of deceit and an illustration of the sinful nature that all of us share that enables us at times to change our loyalties and change our standards like the wind. We all know what it's like to be let down. And the embarrassment, even when we think about it, of how we shared our lives with someone, only to have it thrust back at us. It's not going to have a slap in the face, isn't it? But here is Jesus advancing towards his betrayer and using the word friend. It's the grace that forgives and accepts. Now at this point, you might be interested to know that some commentators find themselves a little puzzled because they're saying... We're not sure whether Jesus is being sarcastic here or not. So, oh, come on in, friend, you know. But I don't, I don't think so. But for what it's worth, given what we've already seen about Jesus' composure, 
I personally understand this use of the word friend to Judas as yet another picture of grace and a holding out of the hand of fellowship and the acceptance even in the event of his betrayal. Because, you know, Judas wasn't the worst. He's always made out to be the worst. He wasn't the worst. Remember Peter? <coughs> Denied Jesus, but he was restored. Judas never denied him. Never. Judas was a zealot. And he probably had issues with the fact that God's kingdom, as Jesus explained it, just wasn't happening fast enough. The problem is we don't have all the details. We don't have the contacts. We don't have the discussions that took place. But let's remember, we mustn't over-spiritualise this either. We've got to remember that these folks were human like us. And they lived in a prevailing culture. And then something else happened. Look at verse 15. Here's the gang fight, right? Okay, Jesus replied, friend, do what you came. And then the men stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reaches for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant, the high priest, and cut off his ear. I call this the ear incident. <laughs> Actually, I've got a story about ears. I've got to tell you this story about ears. Sorry, it's been in my head. I've got to get it out of my system. Okay. There's this guy who was going for a job, okay? And so he says, nothing to do with what we're talking about this morning. You can stop the recording just now. But um, this guy went for a job, and they, it was a quite sensitive job, and he was going to have to deal with people. And so one of the interviewers was this chap who unfortunately had one ear here, and one stuck up there on his head. Nothing could do with it. So um, the first guy goes in, and they said, um, now he said at the end of the interview, do you, do you see anything um, strange about me at all? He says, well, now you mentioned it. I know, know she got one ear up and one ear down. He said, oh, thank you very much. And off he went. Second guy comes in and he interviews him and they take him through and they said to him at the end of the interview, now, just one final question. Do you, do you notice anything about me at all? He said, um, well, yes, I did no notice that you had one ear higher than the other. And um, the third guy goes in and uh, at the end of the interview, they said to him, now, tell me, is, um, do you notice anything different about me? He said, Ah, oh, I did actually. I noticed you wear contact lenses. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, really? How do you know that? He says, well, it looks like that. You're never going to get a pair of glasses. To be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's the ear incident. He does it every time. And I did think, I did, I did have a bit of a chuckle when I was writing this. And I said to my wife, you know, we know that John 18 tells us that, that it was Peter who actually swung the sword. And we know the guy's name was Malchus. And I... I said to my wife, and she said, what are you laughing at? I said, I, I just wondered what Malchus' mum said when he got in the tush. She says, here, what have you been up to? <laughs> okay, let's not be flippant. But the fact is this. You know, we know who the people were. And if Peter had been an experienced swordsman, he would have chopped the guy in half. Because that's a classic headshot. That's the first thing you go for. Straight for the head. And obviously he wasn't that good. He took off the bloke's heel. Either that or Malchus was a bit... Quick, you know. Peter, as impulsive and as enthusiastic as ever, goes in for the kill. You see, he hasn't understood the teaching of Jesus at all. And so it is with so many of us who love the idea of following Jesus with all the intent to live the right way. But we get to the point where our belief or that which supports is under threat and we strike out thinking that for some reason God needs our protection. It's not true. Look at verse 52. It says this. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to them. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Talking about priorities. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will put, at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it says it must happen in this way? I've got a plan here. God has got a plan here. If only you'd just listen, Peter. If only you just took a moment to think about what I was saying. It's great to have your love. It's great to have your intent. It's great to have your enthusiasm. But you know something, Peter, you just don't listen. And I think that's exactly how it is with every single one of us. We just don't listen. And we become so legalistic in one extreme. Or we become so liberal at the other extreme. And so our commitment sort of falls somewhere down there, somewhere. 
And so our efforts become meaningless because they're not focused. They're not any understanding of what God wants. And Jesus, as ever, is as consistent to his teaching as he's been saying to them, look, I tell you something, don't resist an evil person. If they strike you on the left cheek, turn the right one to him. You see, there's important teaching here because, you see, the sovereignty of God is a wonderful thing. Look, says Jesus, if I wanted to fight the battle on these terms, it would be easy, actually. But the purpose of God the Father wouldn't be fulfilled then. So I want you to accept the package as it is. Not with a sense of fatalism or fear, but in the knowledge that whatever this world throws at you, no one can take away the real hope and purpose that you have in your heart because of me. And proof of that testimony, that that message is clear, actually comes later. Because they got it then when he was telling them. The results, you see, were incredible. As they got it, as they passed on the message, as the church began to grow, the results... Turn with me. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. Quickly, let's, let's just read some of that. The writer, just recording people of faith, he says this. And what more should I say? Now, he's already talked about... Um, um, he's talked about Noah, he's talked about Moses, he's talked about some of the great people of faith, he's talked about the journey of the people coming out of Egypt, and then he says, and what more should I say? I don't have time to tell you about Gideon, and Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness would turn to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released, released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the swords. They went, out, went about in sheepskins and goatskins, don't worry, I'll speak louder. Destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the grounds. And these were all commended for their faith, but none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So therefore, since we are surrounded so by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. And let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured that cross, scorning its shame, and then sat down, finished his work, sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. They got it. But this journey wasn't an easy journey to get it. It was a tough journey. It was a human journey. It was a real journey. It was bad decisions. It was mistakes. It was chopping someone's ear off. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You see, the grace of composure is there, but there's a grace that forgives. But there has to be the grace of order and purpose. What a moment. Look at this verse 55. Oh, I better find myself. At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. Faced with an, a mob of armed men, knowing the immediate future, humanly speaking, was pretty grim. There's blood everywhere from Malchus here. Heart rates are high. There's incredible tension. And I don't know if you've been in a fight. Have you ever been in a big fight? Has anyone? 
Or you've got to go, go a few naffies. I'll tell you, I've been in a few naffy fights and it's not nice. When it sparks, it sparks. And the, the number one rule, just in case you're ever in a naffy fight, okay, the number, number one rule in a naffy fight is don't join him, but get to a corner to make sure no one can come near you and then hit anyone who comes near you, okay? The tension is incredible. It's palpable. And what I think is fantastic in this picture here is Jesus calmly slows things down and he reasons with them. But he's more than just a policeman here. And I don't know about you, how you read it, but I think the resolve of the mob had changed. <laughs> when he starts reasoning with them, they're not sure they actually want to arrest him. And then he does something which surprises everyone because remember the disciples are breathing a sigh of relief now. Whew, she's not going to be as bad as all that. And Jesus says, oh, but the plan is you've got to take me, so take me. Jesus is in charge. And he reminds them of the initial plan. And they run. None of us were there, so we don't actually know what happened. But we know that it did. All of these promises, all the good intentions, all the self-gratification, all the self-righteousness that they relied so heavily upon, you know, I've given up everything to follow Jesus. Everything is gone. And they run into the night. We've had a gang fight in Gethsemane. Next week, if you can be with us, we'll be looking at taking the mickey in a court of fools. Let us pray. We recognise our Father as we hear again this story of how you are in control of all these things and yet so often we miss the mark and we, we kind of think that we've got to control everything. But we thank you that you did give up everything for us so that we, the sons of men, can be the sons of God. So help us this day to remember just how much it costs you to devote our lives again to you and to see the way in life in a clearer, fresher way. In Jesus' name. Amen.